Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you all had a good start of the week and we are happy to welcome you to this What Works X webinar. Uh, my name is Hajar and I wish you a warm welcome. So today's webinar topic is about using Brilliant Basics to demonstrate excellence in teaching and learning. So Brilliant Basics are a set of core prerequisites that help demonstrate excellence in teaching and learning. Uh, these principles can drive collaborative learning that can be used uh, to audit the school as a whole across phases, uh, departmentally, and as an instrument to manage uh, teacher performance. Uh, we uh, will take a closer look on how to buy uh, International Academy team are using them. So before we welcome today's uh, presenters, uh, I wish to simply draw your attention uh, to a simple um, menti.com uh, question as an icebreaker before we start. So uh, if I could kindly ask you all to sign to menti.com using the code uh, 2187143. So I repeat the code again. Uh, it's 2187143. All right, so I'll give you just a few minutes till everyone logs onto the to the platform. All right, so I can move on to the question. I hope everyone is in. And the question is, uh, so if you can see the image. And. And basically think of. Um, of some uh, tips or, or, or let's say uh, any ideas on how can we make this environment better? All right, so we have some ideas coming. So interactive classroom. Yes, we would love to hear from you all. So uh, if you can log in and, and uh, just answer this question. OK, we have some more uh, answers. So use a whiteboard for students to, to post their answers. Interesting. OK, we'll give you a few more mi uh, minutes just to see if there are any more ideas. Um, any thoughts? Okay, so by providing uh, examples of a very good teaching learning session like collaborative learning. Exactly, thank you for sharing that. Okay, a couple more minutes for more ideas. OK, we have one interesting one, so more targeted questioning for differentiation and. Uh, and chosen at a random to keep all engaged, paired work answers visually given to check for understanding. Awesome. All right, so thank you all uh, for those answers. Uh, I do ask you to stay. Uh, on menti.com as we will get back to it towards the end of today's uh, webinar. Um, 
and we'll have some sort of feedback questions at the end. So for now, uh, I wish to welcome our presenters for today from Dubai International Academy, uh, Renda Kayali and Claire uh, Inglis, and I'll, I'll stop sharing my screen now and they will be introducing you to today's topic and to basically build on these answers and, and share um, their insights. So without further ado, please, I would like to welcome the ladies to, to carry on. Thank you. Good afternoon, representatives from KHDA and fellow educators. My name is Claire Ingalls and my fellow colleague uh, Renda Kiali and I feel very privileged to be given a platform through What Works to present our Dubai International Academy Brilliant Basics. We are proudly the first international baccalaureate continuum school in the United Arab Emirates offering a world class international education to a student body of over 90 nationalities and a staff from more than 30 countries. We have a strong academic history producing truly internationally minded students, but we also offer extensive pastoral care and afford our students opportunities to shine in sports, the arts and adventure learning. Fundamentally, our brilliant basics were conceived as a means of standardising practice and expectations, a way of garnering a more concise collective view of what outstanding practice looks like. With a staff body of more than 30 nationalities, it was important to procure a shared understanding of sought standards. Hence the fruition of the Brilliant Basics, a set of 10 core prerequisites evidenced within a classroom which demonstrate excellence in learning and teaching. The core principles are climate, environment, planning, learning, inclusion, tasks, technology, questions, assessment and behaviour for learning. To begin, the classroom climate should be a safe and supportive environment. The world of the classroom should be one of challenge, risk taking and curiosity and independent learning. Through personal development, we introduced Vygotsky's zone of proximal development, the place where students facilitated by teachers face challenges which they must try to overcome. Through this study, we learned the importance of placing students in the learning pit. We encourage students to appreciate the beauty of not knowing, but through self endeavour, collaboration, scaffolding and tenacity that all students can work their way out of uncertainty to knowledge, understanding and ultimately learning. We realise that the classroom climate must allow students to struggle and carve solutions thus developing rich life learning skills. As you can see in the zone of proximal development, students can facilitate learning by sharing external resources, clips, podcasts, data, scaffolding resources, but ultimately the learning should be student centric. This learning equips students to self govern and be curious masters of their own knowledge. Now moving on to the environment. Thank you, Claire. Good afternoon, everyone. So not only is the climate important to our student success, but also the environment. We as teachers should ask ourselves at the very start of the year when designing our classrooms, how do we ensure that our classroom and learning spaces are stimulating and will be effectively used by our students to support their needs and scaffold their learning. Therefore, we should consider many factors before making the decision. That the classroom environment should be a blend of the social, the emotional and instructional elements. And to keep in mind that many aspects of our classroom environment can affect the student's motivation. Therefore, if the students are motivated they will put um, more effort into their learning activities. 
when we start designing, perhaps we can start with the layout. So how will we design our desks? We then start trialing different class designs, table group layout, table row layout, horseshoe desks, pair up, or are we open to outdoor learning? Now then we move from the layout to the wall displays. And wall displays are an important part of any classroom as they make the room appear more inviting and create a better learning environment. Yet when thinking of what to use on the walls, the teacher should think of what materials should be visible to ensure success for all the learners. There we can have a combination of terminology related to a specific subject. We can add Bloom's taxonomy, we can add rubrics, and most importantly, we can demonstrate students' work in a way that promotes progress for all. And last, make sure that the boards are regularly updated. Now, here's an example. You have students seating outside the classroom working on a task. And there's actually no single classroom arrangement that promotes positive positive uh, behavior and academic outcomes for all tasks because the nature of the task should dictate the arrangement. So always make sure when you're planning, you have that piece in mind. And this example here shows wall displays. As you can see at the top part, there is the subject related terminology. And at the bottom, there is a clear example of the students work. Thank you very much. Moving on to planning. Thank you, Linda. And so planning is also vitally important. We design our curriculum backwards, mapping our assessment instruments vertically and horizontally. Our lessons are embedded with real world context, role play and cross curricular transferable skills. We set high expectations for all students and ensure each student is challenged. Our lessons are personalised to ensure students are afforded opportunities to flourish and progress so the learning is not capped. Our teachers relish the creation of units which pique students' natural curiosity and desire to push their own expectations of self strive to build lesson design around tangible real world contexts. In business, for example, budgeting is taught through planning a wedding. Differentiating disposable incomes helps students to build pragmatic means of tackling expenditure. In English, students debate about the impact of colonialism through real world lenses. Christian missionaries, De Beers, diamond miners, versus National Geographic conservationists and African tribal leaders, all through the study of Chinua Achebe's seminal work, Things Fall Apart. And also moving on now to learning. Now, when it comes to learning, we teachers need to ask ourselves, how can we develop a learning classroom while creating a growth mindset, as well as keeping the brain in the game? Now, in order to do so, we as teachers need to implement strategies that make the students have a clear overview of their intended learning and how the learning benefits them and what the learning will look like once it's successful. So some examples would be to create a clear learning objectives that are understood by all the students and tailored to their own individual needs. The learning ob objectives must be SMART and SMART stands for specific, measurable, attainable, relevant and timely. Now also the learning outcomes and success criteria are relevant, meaningful and appropriate for each student. So during the lesson or at the end of each unit, the teacher could devise progress checks, peer assessment, teacher feedback, exit card, so that the students are able to feedback on their learning. And this will inform the teacher of the next steps to consider in teaching and learning. So here's, here are some examples of progress checks, plenaries and graphic organizers. So how do we use progress checks? Uh, 
Each progress check includes questions on the area of learning that your student will be covering in the lesson. Just get your students to take the test, then check the answers and you will see straight away if your student has grasped each of the learning skill. Now the plenary also allows you as a teacher to assess the whole class understanding at once. They're planned into a lesson where appropriate to summarize their learning. So it's not necessarily that they have to come at the end of the lesson. They could come actually after each task or after each episode just to ensure that the progress has been checked. And then I have the last example here is the graphic organizers, which can be effective ways to help typical and atypical learners alike. Now, the visual presentation is a unique way to show the students the material that they are learning, and it can appeal to those who are not auditory uh, learners. And moving on to inclusion. Thank you, Amanda. Inclusion is a fundamental, very, very important factor in our planning as well. Inclusivity for all students ensures learning is uncapped with no ceiling. Primarily, the teacher takes complete responsibility for the learning of every student in their care. Effectively, the utilisation of a range of data, individual education plans and careful observations helps teachers to differentiate instruction so it matches students' needs. Furthermore, distinct provision should be fostered to eradicate barriers to learning, such as social, emotional, motivational or specific learning differences. As a consequence, we undertake holistic evaluation of our students as a means to offer practical intervention strategies to mitigate learning challenges. Additionally, we have distinct provision in place to support students with detailed IEPs and EIL provision. We also have an accelerated programme to further challenge our most gifted and talented learners. Here, for example, we have a shared an individual education plan, which disseminates key information about students in terms of learning differences. These are shared with our entire team here at the secondary school and across the primary as well. And they indicate um, specific interests of the students, also the intervention strategies and specific accommodations. There is CAT4 data which is relative to their peers as and it's also a really important vital instrument to give insight to ensure that students are being inclusively catered for within the classroom to ensure that they make significant progress on their learning journey. Moving back now to tasks, Brenda. Thank you, Claire. Now, previously we spoke of the learning in the class that is informed by the students' feedback. Now, once the feedback is analyzed by the teacher, the teacher then is able to set the measurable tasks for her learners. Now, the tasks are planned in a way that encourage all the students to take ownership of their learning, whether it's done through independent work or collaborative work. Now, the tasks should be student centered, which gives the chance of trial and error until the student reaches the discovery uh, level on their own. Now, if the teacher spoon feeds the learner all of the information, the student will not be able to retain more than 5% of what was presented to them. Therefore, the tasks should always be student centered and planned where varied methods of groupings and collaborative work is common. Now, when working together, the activities or learning tasks should ensure that everyone is participating. Everybody's got a, a role, role. Students in the group may work on separate tasks, contributing to a common overall outcome or work together on a shared task. Now, thus students must be given the opportunities to become resourceful and to support each other when appropriate. Now, here is an example of pinwheel discussion. 
Now, pinwheel discussion or the gist is this is a student led discussion discussion uh, strategy which works well when the students all have read different texts and are coming together to discuss a common theme. It also works well if you want your students to explore one text, but from different character perspective or different uh, analytical lenses. Now we move on to technology. Thank you. Um, in the wake of COVID, we all had to upskill, I think. Technology became a vital necessity to drive remote learning and critical thinking. We all had to quickly upskill, become acquainted with a range of different portals to encourage collaborative learning, enhance means of visually sharing aspects of student work to quickly check progress. However, as we transition gradually back to more normal circumstances, we don't stipulate that technology should be a substitute for pen and paper. Instead, we recognise the vital importance that multimodal learning wields in driving media literacy, save web browsing habits, and also acts as a portal to vibrant real world connections. Proudly, our use of technology to advance learning has tangibly manifested in recent years. Padlet offers teachers a means to see live progress, share multimodal resources and allow students opportunities to peer assess. Mentimeter helps hone specific information as being prevalent whilst allowing a shared overview of opinion. And PeerDeck is a prized platform to canvas student responses and integrate polls, true or false, and overall a brilliant mechanism for progress checking as well. And another really important aspect is the use of questioning as a means to check progress and challenge. Thank you, Claire. Now, why is questioning so important? We have many answers to that. Some of them are it, it encourages the students to engage with their work and each other. It helps the students think out loud. It facilitates the learning through active discussion. It empowers the students to feel confident about their ideas and it improves their speaking and listening skills. So in order to make sure the effectiveness of the questions, the questions must be carefully planned and designed to ensure that all students are engaged and challenged to think. Now, how can this be obtained? There is one method that you can try out is the think pair share where the teacher gives the student an inquiry question and then gives the student a suitable time to think of the question to pass it to a peer, which here is you're giving the student a time to discuss different ways into answering the question. And at the end, share the student uh, answer with the class. Now, this method gives every learner an opportunity for success. As they get to think uh, the answer alone, then learn from a peer if they were hesitating with their own response. And by the time they share the answer with the class, they have for sure have gained the confidence to respond to the question uh, um, in front of everyone. Now, the best questions to pose would be critical thinking questions that focus on factual, conceptual and debatable. Uh, they can be done through regular plenaries, mini plenaries, or just simply set as the outcome of the lesson. And here are some examples of factual, conceptual, debatable questions. Now, examples of inquiry questions, which are how teachers encourage looking at a topic through multiple perspectives in order to lead the students through the metacognitive process from academic knowledge to thoughtful action. Now we start with the factual WH questions. Factual questions are the so-called knowledge rich or information based aspect uh, of the learning and where students gain the scheme of learning from. We move to the conceptual. The conceptual questions are higher order questions as they may assess, let's say in science, students understanding of the underlying ideas behind chemical phenomena or require students to explain, explain an unfamiliar uh, phenomenon 
or test the transfer of knowledge to a new situation. Then last, we have our debatable questions, which start to open up points of controversy or encourage students to perhaps question previous learning or deepen understanding of complex issues. Now then here I have just an example of what a think pair share question would look like where the students assessed their level of understanding on a specific outcome. Moving on to assessment. Thank you. Um, here at DIA Emirates Hills, we've spent a lot of time uh, working on our assessment model and um, we're proud of some of the changes that we've made. Assessment methodologies are essentially utilised to effectively move students to the next step in their learning journey. Alongside this, the data that is procured on this journey is analysed by teachers and learners to enhance progress and attainment. Our curriculum is, as I mentioned before, designed backwards and thus incremental skills development is key to building our students confidence across the subject disciplines. We've spent a great deal of time coaching our students to be active participants in their own learning through consistent and staggered reflection. Our feed forward mar marking strategy ensures students carry out assessment, receive feedback, assign new learning goals based on the feedback and engage in a process of recalibrating their learning. Essentially, formative feedback looks forward to alter future work. Hence, students may engage in redrafting or reapplying skills based on feedback and feed forward marking may engage students also in rephrasing, redoing, retesting. Thus, this rich process of ref reflection and reapplication pinpoints gaps in knowledge, concepts or processes, enabling teachers and students to use feed forward assessment as a means of closing gaps. A fundamental feature in our assessment framework is, as you can see, feed forward marking. This is exemplified here for you. You can clearly see teacher annotation. There is a combination of written and highlighted what went well and even better if feedback. However, in purple, it is evident the student has acted on feedback and thus cyclically feeding forward has allowed the student to recalibrate and tangibly showcase their pro progress. Our aim of assessment is to transparently allow, allow students to affect change by their own self endeavour facilitated by strategic fee feed forward marking. And this process uh, continues not just in English, but across the board. All of our subject disciplines focus on feed forward marking where students have to act on the feedback that they're given. Moving now to behaviour for learning. Thank you. Now, our final prerequisite of the brilliant basics is behaviour for learning. Now, behaviour for learning is crucial in the classroom to ensure success in all of the above mentioned categories, as it emphasises the crucial link between the way in which students learn, their social knowledge and their behaviour. Behaviour for learning establishes positive relationships between self, others and the curriculum. When the three elements are promoted in agreement, they contribute to a culture of positive learning behaviour. Now, some of the ways to achieve this goal is done by frequent oral or written feedback to students or praise. And this form of praise is reinforced as it's less costly as extrinsic rewards such as crisps, which might impose a burden on the teacher. And once this intrinsic praise is done, it will help strengthen the student's self-esteem. Now, you can still reward your students, but be careful as the outcome of the tasks with rushed rewards may even be an incentive for the student to sacrifice the quality of their work. 
In our school, for example, we have a house system which helps drive healthy competition in academics, sports, and outdoor learning. We offer leadership roles, certificates, enroll students in gifted and talented programs as a means to show that we appreciate their hard work and achievements. Looking at this example, um, this is an example of a house system. And what is actually the benefit between, uh, behind the house system? Now, using a house point system has been shown to have a positive impact on motivation and behavior, as well as encouraging a sense of identity and belonging among school students. Now, such systems include all the students, not just the highest achievers, and they help develop a variety of skills other than academic. How do you use the house point to motivate your students? You can create an attractive and fun display to record and monitor your classes or your schools' house point, which will reinforce their sense of motivation and friendly competition when they see their house points accumulating. Thank you. Here you go. Thank you very much. So finally, at Dubai International Academy Emirates Hills, we note that the brilliant basics are not pedagogical rocket science. They are core staples which should be integrated within each outstanding classroom. The brilliant basics are a collection of prerequisites that together can be revolutionary in advancing learning and teaching. Alongside the implementation of these standards, we've afforded time to audit our staff to determine their own personal targets. We've grouped our staff based on their targets and developed personal learning communities to help foster professional curiosity through action research. Another fundamental factor in the creation of these PLCs is the desire to encourage sharing of practice and cross curricular partnerships. Now COVID restrictions are being relinquished. We intend to foster an open door teaching uh, culture and a culture of also popping into each other's lessons and harnessing expertise and innovative strategies from within our staff body. We want to breed a culture of pedagogical enrichment. We'd like to thank you very much for your participation today and look forward to answering any questions that you may have. OK, thank you so much, uh, Claire and Brenda. So uh, we'll move now into the Q&A section of this webinar. Uh, we do encourage you to uh, pose your questions uh, on the live chat. Uh, so there is a feature there or if you want in the chat. Uh, and for now, I'll just uh, run through a few pre-submitted uh, questions from our audience. So uh, the first question, uh, uh, it's about um, uh, covering the content at the same time uh, while teaching the students uh, piece. So it's an activity based uh, activity based learning is effective for higher classes. Is it effective for higher classes? OK, so we have two questions. I'll answer the first one first. So yeah. uh, how to cover the content, right? Now, honestly, the art of pacing lies in creating a sense of urgency. So you need to show your students that there's a specific time um, and then the class is going to go uh, in a specific pace. Now, when you're pacing the lesson, though, you have to think diligent pace and not some sort of a frantic pace where you're rushing your students. So you can use a timer. That's one example, but make sure to provide time to think first. Um, at the start of the lesson, also, you can make your goals clear. So show the students, showcase what we will be doing today. So make sure that the students are focused on the transitions. They know what's coming next and have smooth transitions. Keep the verbal cues coming. 
Um, make sure all the materials you have set for that lesson are there. Um, try to present the instruction visually, but if you can't do that, then you can present it orally and keep asking the students uh, what should we do next. Um, last, check for understanding. So progress checks are the best way to ensure uh, the right pace. Now, try to choose the most effective type of teaching. How does this information uh, summarize a specific section? OK, and always we can assign a timekeeper, right? We could assign Dele a timekeeper. We can uh, delegate, delegate, roles. delegate roles to different students. And I think fundamentally it's about the teacher facilitating the students and engaging with them to also prompt them and guide them to the next stage in the lesson. So I think teacher facilitation is a very important mechanism in driving the pace of a lesson. And the second question I think was if uh, the effectiveness of activity based learning in higher, higher activity based learning in higher level classes and higher level classes. So we, we say yeah, it's, yes, classes. It's, it's effective in all classes, not only high level classes, because this is the only method where you ensure that the knowledge is getting mutually constructed with others. And then the learning is uh, sort of collaborative and co-constructed between the learner and his uh, social environment. So yes, it's highly effective for all. That's right. And just building what Renda's saying, um, a higher level classes really are thirsty for collaboration because a lot of the higher order thinking is fostered through that kind of communication. We have very intelligent students in our, our, our classes who often come to their learning with a different cultural perspective, different levels, and ultimately this is another way of really fostering learning, but doing it in a way that's interactive and very, very meaningful. So it can be utilised from KG all the way up to year 13. It's, it's, it's very important to have collaborative learning as part of your core, core learning standards. Awesome, thank you ladies. Uh, so we have another question and uh, basically says what are strategies that we can use to control misbehavior in the classroom? So we did mention in uh, one of our prerequisites, which was the last one, the behavior for learning. And we said the most effective way would be um, uh, praise, whether it was written or it was oral. Uh, make sure that the environment um, is built on mutual respect where the teacher respects the student and the student respects the teacher and habits are taking place in the classroom. That's, such as that's right. Typ typical behaviours have to be um, induced within the classroom from the onset. It's about that mutual etiquette that is explored in a room where each person is respected fully. And also, I think it's important if you see negative behaviours in a particular student, the best way to try to bring them back on board is sometimes to empower them, is to give them responsibility, is to offer praise, not to bring them down and make them feel less. It's about actually giving them a, a sense of responsibility and ownership. Sometimes the students that misbehave feel disenfranchised. They don't feel part of the classroom. Maybe they feel that they have learning differences. It's a way of trying to bring them back is to sometimes offer them a role of responsibility. And also um, praising good behaviour in order to showcase in front of them what good behaviour looks like. And um, if there is an issue with uh, a student that is challenging you in the classroom, also try your best to make it discreet. Don't go and shout <laughs> at the child in front of the entire class or send them off outside the door. Yeah, so. And using uh, nonverbal cues, uh, putting the, a hand up as the teacher to say, I'm talking and they're listening. Sometimes I'll put the light off if I want to say something very important. It just gives everybody a focus and you get back everyone's attention. 
or you can use um, other different mechanisms where you're using verbal, not non-verbal cues as a way of showcasing exactly what the expectations are. Hope, hope so that was building helpful. the nice habits, building it. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. So maybe building on that, I'll take one question from the live uh, from the live chat or the live Q and A. Uh, uh, so maybe how um, how do you manage to motivate students to continue to learn, especially those with SEN? Uh, so equally, like uh, kind of ensure that everyone, regardless of their needs, are kind of motivated. I think it's really important. Uh, I sh showcase the individual educational uh, plan. We use those very, very um, often to understand what the learning climate is for for our students and understand what their learning differences are. And so motivation comes in terms of our differentiation is how we tailor our lessons to ensure that every single le learner in that room is motivated. It could be the way they are grouped. It could be the, the, um, the strategy of specific tasks and it could be perhaps the scaffolding that we put in place. And so we tend to break things down into smaller components to ensure that some of our uh, lear learners who are struggling understand the basics. We could have one to one intervention. We can do paired work with other students. We can also have out of class support. And essentially it's about trying to drive the learning in whatever ma manner we can using a multitude of different strategies. But hopefully the lesson design itself should be motivational. We should be accessing our le learners. We should know who they are, know what their likes are, understand them as an entity in themselves. And if we know that, then our lesson design will actually by its own design motivate all our le learners in that in that classroom. And Claire, you showed an example previously about the IEPs. So also using the provisions in order to gear up your lesson and try to make it uh, personalized uh, for our students is also essential. Personalization is the key. <coughs> awesome, thank you, ladies. And uh, um, we have also another question, basically about the tools. So how can we incorporate technological tools uh, to upteach? Yes, technology. I mean, all of us had to upskill dramatically during the COVID period. I think that that was revolutionary for many of us. And ultimately what um, has happened is we've got quite a, a good abreast of lots of different platforms. And we were saying that it's good to use platforms, but not too many in one lesson. And it's good to hone our skills and our managing of those platforms. We've um, been looking at um, languages for the last couple of weeks and doing some auditing about um, the use of technology pace. And we've seen some brilliant work on Nearpod where there is a, a multimodal platform to use listening, speaking activities. There's drag and drop uh, exercises. There's a means of students to work collaboratively and also independently. So this has been a brilliant platform for us to see how differentiation can be implemented through a particular platform. Most of us are very, very adept at using Padlet. It's a way of sharing information and it's an, also an way of garnering information. It's a brilliant mechanism to see students live work and we can give very quick, effective verbal feedback because we have total visibility of the entire class working on a specific task. Um, and there are basic means which we, we, we use, which are using a shared document, be it a Google Doc or a Word Doc, where students can just work on a, a paired activity or in groups sharing a PowerPoint and working and collaboratively honing their learning in one means is, is another way. So technology is brilliant, but we also recognise as a school that we need to go back to the basics. We need to teach students how to write. We need them to be more adept at using pen and paper. So as we move beyond COVID, 
our endeavour is to bring back basic skills as well as using technology. That is going to be an interesting transition for all of us. Thanks. That's true. So uh, I have one interesting question from uh, our live audience. So uh, it basically says that teaching can be differentiated, tasks can be differentiated, but the board assessments are the same for all. So how can that be take, uh, taken a good care of? So students have to appear for exams as all other students. So how can we help the students? So in a world of a standardization, so how can we ensure that uh, the customization somehow addresses each individual need? So the learning process is vital in that case. Um, we as teachers set our tasks based on the end of year assessment. So because we're doing the backward planning, we've already done the differentiation. We've completed that segment by ensuring that everyone has learned the material in their own personalized way. Right? That's right. And also fundamentally, we are using this as a means of trying to, to develop skills. Differentiation helps develop skills and thus those skills can then be tested at a later date. OK, the assessment is going to be fundamentally the same, but through the differentiation and through the process of learning over time, hopefully those skills will be re refined and the student will feel more empowered and more confident. But the differentiation has to be implemented in order for those skills to be fostered and really, really nurtured. OK, thank you. Uh, so any tips for gifted uh, or talented students? Um, yeah, um, just give them ownership. Give your gifted students ownership of their learning. Provide a free of choice. Free of choice tasks where, let's say, um, the student will make the decision on which activities, let's say, to complete. One good example we use here is blended learning. We have mastery grouping. Uh, personal, we give the gifted students, as well as everyone in the classroom, some personal time to think and to choose what extension task, let's say, they want to work on. Um, we could ask our gifted students, let's say, if you're in English, to create, let's say, a playlist uh, as an extension task for an activity uh, or for a topic that they have completed that day. So that that's just one quick example. Sure, we we um, have an alpha program. It's called here where we um, pinpoint students who um, need a little bit more challenge. We've got a great rich after school program as well where students can participate in the uh, robotics club MUN. We're also encouraging uh, young women to get involved in STEM. And so we not only are we concerned about what's happening inside the classroom, but we're affording rich opportunities out with the classroom. But within the classroom, we do use flipped learning models for our, our, our higher achievers, where we can give specific tailored projects to those students to help foster again more independent thinking. And sometimes we can do that individually or by grouping students. But ultimately, every lesson, we are ensuring that there is challenge for all. We use critical thinking. We use our questioning to devise that critical thinking. And that is a way of also ensuring that our, our students are, are feel that they are being um, stretched as well. That's why when I mentioned the learning pit, we like to put students into that pit where they don't know because we like to see how they crawl out of that pit through their own self endeavor. Um, but there's a, a number of different strategies that support our, our, our most capable learners. Right, so I'll take one last question and it's basically how do uh, how do you use uh, scaffolding and lessons? And also the audience would like to know the duration of your lessons. Uh, so one example of scaffolding is um, we follow Vygotsky's zones of proximal development. So um, we have our students that require the extra work to be grouped with 
let's say our high attainers um, and then everybody's got let's say a role in a specific group um, and then here the high attainer is helping uh, the low attainer reach their zone of proximal development until they have reached a level where they can actually work on their own and do the work independently. So we do we utilize different types of groupings. It might be mixed ability. We might base our, our, our groupings on ability and scaffolding might be using graphic organizers. It might be utilizing an SOS sheets or cheat sheets where we give extra materials. We um, also use um, modeling very, very. Uh, uh, that's a, a fundamental part of our lesson design so that we all we show the success criteria. We make that visible and we also give a, a model of what we, uh, what we are expecting. And so we try to break our learning into more manageable components. And so that is determined by which groups we are focusing on. So sometimes if we are based uh, basing our groups on ability, then we will devise a range of support materials to ensure that we are gu guiding and facilitating the students through that learning pit gradually. Um, but we are again trying to enable them to foster their own resilience by using their research skills and their understanding and learning and perspective from within the group as well. But a lot of it is to do with uh, graphic organisers and support materials that's very much tailored to the groups. Thank you. And I know I said that was the last question, but we received one more interesting one and we'll end with that. And basically it says uh, we as adults don't, don't use much of a pen and paper in our daily work. Why do you think it is important for children to keep using it when in the future it might become obsolete uh, with improve with improving technology? I think that um, we should not re we should not advance too far. There are basics which are fundamental. Pen and paper is the way we've communicated for centuries, thousands and thousands of years. We went, we, we didn't start with paper, but we started with a slate or a wall, and this is a fundamental tool of communication. We don't, we, we need to foster those fundamental skills, and that's just from a human point of view. What I think we also have to consider is we are in enabling students to function as learners in the wider world. Pen and paper are a, a quick mechanism of writing and communicating ideas, but also we're governed by our exam rudiments and we are uh, teaching students in the IB International Baccalaureate and our our whole examination mechanism in year 12 and 13 is all handwritten. So that's another very important means of of de de developing those fundamental skills. But I, I think it would be a tragedy if we lost those skills personally. And yes, I do agree. So uh, thank you so much again, uh, ladies, for the informative session. Uh, and uh, thank you everyone for the audience for tuning in. So we have one last part. We want to hear from our audience about their feedback. And for those who missed maybe the first part, uh, you can just simply log into menti.com. I'll be sharing my screen now. OK. And uh, okay, I think it's just refreshing. Okay, one second. So I need to reshare that again. Um, OK, 
Okay, here we go. Technology. <laughs> so basically, we'll be grateful for your feedback, and you need to simply log into um, Mentimeter or Menti.com and use the code two one eight seven one four two three. And basically, we would like you uh, uh, to share your opinion about uh, your satisfaction. Uh, so how satisfied were you with the quality of the content of the webinar, the structure of the webinar and the presenter presenters uh, preparedness and responding to the questions? So I'll give you a couple of minutes. Okay, so the code again for those who missed it, it's uh, 21871423. Right, let's move to the uh, next question. So what has been the main takeaway from today's webinar? And it's an open-ended question, so we'd love to hear um, your thoughts, feedback, ideas. Awesome, keep them coming. We'd love to hear from you and also if you have any ideas for next sessions as well. OK, one last minute. All right, thank you everyone uh, for tuning in today and for your uh, interactiveness and, and uh, listening to the webinar today. So for more information, you can visit uh, the New Days, New Ways website and which you can see on the screen. And the session itself will be also shared uh, on our YouTube channel. Uh, I'd like to thank again uh, Claire and um, Brenda for their uh, informative session today. And I wish you a good uh, rest of the day and the rest of the week. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. You Thank you for the opportunity.